Thank you so much for coming to our studios, Carl. How are you thank today? Thank you very much. I'm doing just fine, thank you. Let's see how the stock markets are doing, shall we? Uh, sure. The U.S. stocks are up after the data. I was afraid to look, but that's <laughs> good news. So it's, is it really good? Well, it's not great news, but I think we are finally um, getting a little bit of clarity on how much Europe is impacting developments in the U.S. And I will say, at least to this point, hmm. uh, there seems to be only minimal impact on the U.S. macro data uh, from developments in Europe. Most importantly, this morning's jobless claims numbers uh, held in, and jobless claims are one of the most timely indicators of labor market activity. Uh, the fact that they're holding in at levels that are consistent with where they were uh, not only last month, but in January, February, March, and April tells us that the labor market is holding up and we're not collapsing in the face of this uncertainty over Europe. Now, certainly this could change over the next couple of months, and we'll keep a careful eye on the data, but so far, so good. Is it where you want it, it to be? I would love it to be uh, for jobless claims to yes. be lower and jobs growth to be stronger, uh, absolutely. Uh, the average year to date has been about 200,000 jobs created per month. Mm -hmm. That's sufficient to drive down the unemployment rate uh, and keep the economy moving in a positive direction at uh, two and a half to three percent type of growth rate. Uh, we saw a little bit of stall in the labor data. It may have been payback from warmer weather uh, mm -hmm. earlier mm -hmm. in the year. Uh, Next week's uh, uh, employment report will be a, a very key development. Uh, we're looking for about 150,000 jobs to be created. Uh, as long as we're in the 150 to 250 uh, zone mm -hmm. on payroll gains, uh, that's sort of the sweet spot for the economy. If we fall below 100, mm -hmm. uh, that will be sort of a warning shot across the bow that uh, we are ex experiencing a, a slowdown like we saw last summer. Well put. Very good analysis. Thank, Thank you. you. How about the demand for business equipment in the U.S.? It falls for the second month. How do you well, read that? Well, the durables numbers didn't look so great. Absolutely. Mm. It's the second month that this has happened. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a fluke with the first month in the quarter that it seems to unify universally be weak and, uh, and and send a false signal that uh, activity is much weaker than it will uh, eventually turn out to be in the quarter. And we've mm. seen this about two-thirds of the time over the past four years or so. Uh, there's a little bit of a hangover, I think, happening in terms of business spending on equipment and software because uh, a, an important tax credit expired at the end of the year, uh, and so now we're in the lull after that tax credit expired, or at least it, it minimized. It was 100% capital depreciation allowance. That dipped back to only 50%. So there was some incentive to pool business spending uh, earlier uh, into uh, actually into last yes. year. Uh, the impo hmm. the important thing, yes, more important than the we tax. We need to hear that. <laughs> exactly. More important than this tax uh, <laughs> related hangover uh, is the fact that there has been a dearth of investment uh, uh, by businesses since uh, basically since the recession took hold and so we've seen industrial capacity yes. actually decline in the US for only the second time since record keeping began uh, this means that if the economy continues to grow and orders continue to pile up eventually businesses are going to have to say I'm sorry we can't fill those orders send them to Europe or Asia or elsewhere because mm. we simply do not have the capacity we're producing more GDP than at any time before, including the peak before the recession. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing it with an industrial capacity level that's back at 2006 levels. Talking about the GDP, you brought it up. Sure. What are your numbers? What is the outlook? What are your, in, the, in terms of Deutsche Bank securities? Numbers? I think we'll see a little bit of a downward revision to the first quarter GDP numbers. Those are out uh, this coming Thursday, one week from today. Uh, how much? How I, I think we'll see a, a sub 2% type of number. Not, not significantly below 2%, but let's say about 1.8%. Okay. Uh, however, the good news is, I think it will be a wedge-shaped profile for GDP growth this year, meaning we'll see an ongoing but modest acceleration to something closer to about 3% by the end of the year. Hmm, you're covering everything about the housing <laughs> sector. Are you, I see that you're bullish in terms of the, the U.S. economy. Housing is Are bringing a smile to my face because it does? at this point in time, everyone is focused on what's happening in Europe and that whole situation. Right. And sort of under the radar, housing finally appears to be turning the quarter. Uh, turning the corner, uh, and I, uh, I blame that for simple supply and demand economics. We have finally worked through the inventory overhang, mm -hmm. uh, which means that even if we did see the same lousy pace of home sales like mm -hmm. we saw last year or the year before, it will have a very different price outcome. The inventory has been worked off. Mm. Uh, supply and demand tells us we're at the market clearing price, uh, and now as home sales begin to accelerate, as we've seen in some of the data series, mm. prices should finally turn the corner. I'm not calling for a significant turn in home prices, mm -hmm. uh, but just
just the mere fact that prices are stable and not falling further is an important signal to both buyers and lenders uh, that finally it's safe to re-enter the market. And on that point, a lot of the recent home price data has been favorable. New home prices are up, existing home prices, Case-Shiller looks like it's turning the corner, a whole slew of home price metrics indicate that we are finally, potentially, the right track. at the turning point. So that makes you happy. That makes me very How happy. How about the non-farm <laughs> payrolls and your expectations this month? Do, are, do they make you happy too? Well, we'll wait to see what that looks like but next what is Friday. Your projection? Yeah. We're forecasting 150,000. 150, okay. I think the unemployment rate will hold steady at 8.1%. Uh, hmm. And given what's going on in the global economy now, if we achieve those types of numbers, uh, they're not great. But I'll be satisfied with that type of print. How about for the whole year? For the, the whole year, yeah. this is a very interesting story right now because productivity is slowing in the economy. Uh, and this is finally starting to get economists' attention. Now, you'll tell me, Carl, slowing productivity is a negative economic you took development. It from me. It's not a good <laughs> thing. At this point in the economic cycle, it is just what the economy needs because slower productivity growth, and mind you, we're growing at 0.5 mm -hmm. on productivity growth right now, 0.5%. Slowing productivity means it now takes more workers to create an additional unit of output. In other words, to get the same GDP growth we got last year now requires more workers, which means a faster pace of hiring. Mm. So productivity has stalled. GDP growth continues to accelerate. That's a very positive omen for hiring, assuming that Europe doesn't tip the whole boat over. Very interesting. And you brought it right to, into the Europe. Sure. Is this really Pandora's box? We've been reading every that this is going to be Pandora's box in Spain, Portugal, and even France next. Do you agree with this statement? Well, certainly the developments in Europe are troubling, uh -huh. and the main risk for the U.S. economy is not that Europe slides into a recession and demand for U.S. export is weakened, because the U.S. doesn't export all that much to Europe. We produce many of the same things here that are produced in Europe, like automobiles, commercial aircraft, those types of items. So the real risk for the U.S. economy is financial contagion out of mm -hmm. Europe and into the U.S. So when we see things like we've seen in the past couple of weeks, where European equity markets decline and U.S. equity markets follow suit or European credit spreads widen mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing happens in the U.S., that tells us that financial contagion is taking place. If that uh, takes place in the, U in the U.S. economy for a lasting period, uh, then that could be troubling. So we're just at the, the turning point where banks are finally starting to have confidence to lend, at least domestically, uh, and if, if Europe really tanks, that could uh, upset the apple cart, so to speak. Can you materialize that uh, impact? Can you gauge this much is going to be drawn or lost in the U.S. in terms of the impact? Of it's, the it's very hard to do. If it was an, a direct export linkage, uh, that would be more mm -hmm. feasible. We export about 10 percent or 10 to 12 percent of our exports go to the eurozone. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of financial contagion, that is uh, m much more difficult to uh, to model. Certainly we know what's happening now has not been positive for uh, the U.S. economy, but we watch leading indicators of activity like tax revenue, which is still growing, mm -hmm. uh, jobless claims, one of the most timely economic indicators, which as we already mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. are holding up. Uh, so at least uh, the, the very uh, real-time gauges of activity tell us that uh, uh, yes, things have soured in Europe, but it's not materially uh, weighing on the U.S. economy, at least not yet. Are we also ready as the U.S. economy or Fed, like Kuchar Lakota talked the other day, and, and we do not have an umbrella, he said, for the crisis that's going on in the Eurozone. They even talk about 75% of devaluation of Greek drachma against Euro once Greece leaves the zone, Eurozone. Is that scary to you? Uh, any of those types of, I mean, a any news that is not more stability in Europe is, is certainly bad news. So, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly cautiously uh, watching the developments there. Uh, what's interesting, despite all of uh, what's been happening in Europe since you brought up the right. Fed, uh, we seem to be hearing a, a steady message from the Fed that they do want to wean the economy off of monetary stimulus. And so the big debate among economists right now is, uh, you know, whether or not the Fed will extend 
end Operation Twist at their June meeting, uh, whether there could will be they? additional do quantitative easing. Uh, we do not think they will, uh, and I'm surprised because I hear Fed policymakers who are relatively dovish leaning, like Dudley, like Lockhart. Now, Coach Lakota is one of the hawks uh, on the Fed, mm -hmm. but all of these individuals have indicated that uh, despite current developments, uh, they still think that additional policy accommodation is not warranted. So the Fed is really trying to drive the point home that they are not ready to do more, uh, at least not yet. Now, if next week's payroll report is a bust, uh, right. that could certainly change sentiment. But for now, the economy's hanging in there despite these uh, significant headwinds coming out of Europe. So, but some, some say that, Carl, uh, if Fed does any QE through any stimulus, it should be doing before the elections. That would be smart to do it. Do you agree with this? Well, the, the important thing is if they need to provide stimulus, they provide it in a timely fashion. So I think that uh, the, the election certainly looms November. significantly yeah. on the horizon, right. uh, but the Fed will deliver the appropriate policy regardless of the timing of the election. Yeah. And uh, I, I think they would like to avoid doing something immediately ahead of the election, but as we've seen in the past, the Fed uh, will do what's right despite the, uh, the, the uh, political uh, outcome. Thank you so much. Our time is up, but this was very valuable. Thank you for coming. Thank you. My pleasure.